Hello and welcome to lecture 14 of the NPTEL MOOCs course on Economic Growth and Development. This is lesson 3 of week 5. In the first lesson of week 5 that is lecture 12, we examined the issue of uh, growth and inequality. And in, the, in, this lecture, in, the, in, in this lecture 12, we uh, dealt uh, in some uh, detail the issue of uh, the, uh, an inequality uh, index. And we saw that there are certain uh, principles that guide uh, the, uh, me the measure of inequality in index. Uh, we also looked at the issue of uh, world income inequality or uh, how inequality is defined variously based upon the paper by Branko Milanovic. In today's class, we will look at two uh, important uh, measures of inequality that is the Lorentz curve and the Gini coefficient uh, and we will see how these two uh, inequality measures are some of the most widely used measures of inequality and how they uh, conform to the very basic principles of uh, what uh, of, uh, of what an inequality index uh, should qualify. Now, uh, by now we are clear about this fact that inequality and poverty, although they are being examined together in uh, many cases, they mean different things. Uh, poverty refers to a certain group of population. It is looking at the life conditions of the poorer groups of population vis-a-vis -vis the richer groups of population. So, the concentration is more on uh, what are the living standards of uh, people of a certain group of population who have not had access to the very bare uh, minimum. Whereas, inequality may uh, be examined within the context of the richer groups of population or the poorer groups of population or across the entire uh, set of population. So, when we are looking at inequality, it is uh, defined ov over an entire population. We are looking at how uh, different groups of population are different between each other uh, with respect to certain given indicators say income or wealth uh, or uh, we are also looking at how uh, the entire population is distributed with respect to a certain indicator say income, wealth or any other social indicator. So, in that sense in, uh, inequality and poverty are referring to two different uh, issues although they are discussed uh, together. And as such because they are referring to two different sets of issues, there are different measures of poverty and inequality and often there is some sort of a confusion that uh, poverty and inequality measures mean the same thing. Uh, let us uh, look at this slide here. In when we are looking at uh, the when we are examining the examining the issue of poverty, we come across various poverty indicators. Some of them being, uh, say, the uh, Human Development Index or uh, various other uh, poverty indicators by uh, with respect to uh, vulnerability, income, voicelessness, and so on. So, accordingly you will find measures that uh, estimate uh, uh, life expectancy, education, living standards, uh, it may include human capital, school enrollment, school attendance, uh, vulnerability indices and so on. But when we are looking at inequality, there are various measures of inequality that are uh, used in the for examining economic issues. However, the two most important that we will be considering in this class is the Lorentz curve and the Gini coefficient. Now, if you let us also uh, revise some of the uh, principles that we had done in the last class in lesson 1 of this week uh, when we were saying that a good inequality index usually satisfies uh, these, uh, uh, these uh, principles. Uh, now, before that when we are examining inequality indices, what are we doing? We are basically permitting ranking of income or wealth distributions in two different situations. So, the question naturally arises what are the properties that a desirable inequality index should satisfy and therefore, we lay down weak criteria that many inequality indices can be suggested based upon which many inequality indices can be suggested and each consistent with the criteria, but probably giving very different results when used in actual inequality comparisons. Uh, let us briefly revise the inequality, the principles uh, which should be satisfied by an inequality index which we had done in lesson 1 of this week. Uh, so, suppose a society is composed of n individuals, we use the index i to stand for a generic individual. So, i comprises of uh, these uh, uh, individuals 1 to n 
and income distribution is a description of how much income yi is received by each individuals y1 y2 yn so we are interested in comparing the relative inequality of two income distributions and to this end we need to capture some of our intuitive notions about the about inequality in the form of an applicable criteria and one of the first principles is the anonymity principle that we had discussed in uh, the uh, in lecture 12 now what does this mean from an ethical point of view it basically says that it does not matter who is earning the income when we are measuring uh, uh, and when we are uh, coming up with an inequality index uh, based upon the anonymity principle, we are basically looking at the overall inequality in a country and it does not matter to us who, uh, which individual is earning how much income as long as we are able to order the individuals in terms of their levels of incomes. So, from an ethical point of view, it does not matter who is earning the income. A situation where say Devraj earns X and Rajiv earns Y should be viewed as identical to one in which Devraj earns Y and Rajiv earns X. So, different permutations of incomes are allowed based upon the anonymity principle. Now, Devraj may well be disgusted with this sort of change because if X happens to be larger than Y, but it will be very difficult for him to persuade other people that the overall degree of inequality in his society has deteriorated because of this. So, when we are uh, measuring the overall levels of inequality, it does not matter to us uh, who earns how much income as long as we are able to order the levels of income uh, based upon uh, some kind of an uh, some, some kind of a sequence. So, permutations of income among people should not matter for inequality judgments and that is the principle of anonymity. So, we are arranging our income distribution based upon this principle where y1 is less than y2 and so on. The incomes are arranged sequentially in an uh, uh, increasing order which is the equivalent of arranging individuals so that they are ranked from poorest to richest. So, an individual earning y1 has the lowest income and the in individual earning y, uh, yn has the highest income and so on. So, that is the anonymity principle. The second principle that we had studied was the population principle which is also equally uh, important uh, when we are trying to come up with an inequality index. Now, what does the population, what did the population principle tell us? It tells us that cloning the entire population and their incomes should not alter inequality. So, more formally if we compare an income distribution over n people and another population of 2 n people with same income pattern repeated twice. There should be no difference in inequality among the two income distributions and this population principle is basically a way of saying that population size does not matter. All that matters are the proportions of the population that earn different levels of income. The third uh, principle was a relative income principle which said that if uh, one income distribution is obtained from another by scaling everybody's income up or down by the same percentage, then inequality should be no different across the uh, two distributions. The fourth principle was the Dalton principle which was formulated by Dalton in 1920 and this criterion is uh, fundamental to the construction of measures of inequality. So, it says that let uh, there be uh, y1, y2, y3, yn, let these be the uh, income distribution and let us consider two incomes yi and yj where yi is less than yj and uh, let us say that uh, uh, a transfer of income takes place from uh, the not rich individual to the uh, not poorer individual which will be and this and then this will be called a regressive transfer. So, here the not rich individual earning income is y i and the not poorer is uh, y j. Notice the usage of the term not poorer and not rich instead of using the term poor and rich for uh, these two here because largely when we are looking at inequality, when we are looking at distribution of incomes or when we, when we are examining the issue of inequality, we are mostly concerned with, we are mostly uh, using uh, the term relative income uh, rather than absolute uh, incomes and therefore the uh, usage of the terms not so rich or not so poor and so on and so forth. So, uh, here when a transfer of income takes place from the not rich individual to the not poorer individual, it will be called a regressive transfer and the Dalton principle states that if one income distribution can be achieved from another by constructing a sequence of regressive transfers, then the former distribution must be more unequal than the uh, latter. So, based upon these principles, we uh, try to, uh, in economics we try to come up with an inequality index 
uh, which will help us answer some of the questions with uh, less uh, bias. In this context, uh, there are two measures of inequality which are uh, highly uh, discussed. Uh, one is the Lorentz curve and the second is the Gini coefficient. We will presently see how to read a Lorentz curve and how to read a Gini coefficient. Uh, and uh, the calculation of the Lorentz curve and the Gini coefficient are uh, the uh, one some of the most easiest uh, 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 calculation uh, procedures. And uh, however, uh, it is uh, uh, they are very significant in the sense that uh, they uh, reflect. A, uh, a lot of inequality across regions as well as within the uh, regions. So, in that sense, these are the two highly used measures of uh, inequality. Now, let us begin with the Lorentz curve. The Lorentz curve was uh, first introduced in uh, 1905 uh, by uh, Max O. Lorentz and it basically plots the percentage of total income earned by various portions of the population when the population is ordered by the size of their incomes. So, what is it basically doing? It is a graphical representation of uh, income uh, inequality or wealth inequality and this was developed by the American economist uh, Max Lawrence. What it uh, does is that if you look at this uh, graph here on the slide uh, which is showing uh, presently, it basically shows the graph, the Lawrence curve graph plots uh, percentiles of population according to income or wealth on the horizontal axis. So, this is how the Lawrence curve looks like. This is the x axis here and this is the y axis here. On the x axis, uh, the uh, cumulative, uh, the, uh, the percentiles of population or households are uh, uh, plotted and it plots cumulative income or uh, wealth on the vertical axis. So, in this diagram, if the x value is uh, 40 and uh, an x value of 40 and a y value of uh, let us say around uh, uh, 24 would mean that the bottom 40 percent of the population controls about 24 percent of the total income or wealth. So, if we are plotting the y value here, let us say uh, which is say about 24, which is about let us say 24, then what we are essentially saying is that uh, 40 percent of the households control about 24 percent of the total income or wealth. And the Lorentz curve is often accompanied by a straight diagonal line as you can see here with a slope of 1 which represents uh, perfect equality in income or wealth distribution. And the Lorentz curve when it is plotted, when the num percentage of households are plotted according to the uh, percentages of income that they control, we come up with this Lorentz curve here which is plotted against the line of uh, equality. So, the Lorentz curve lies beneath the line of uh, equality showing the actual distribution of income across all of these households. This is one of the most simplest uh, Lorentz curves here and uh, uh, this shows that. So, there are two things that are being showed here, the uh, area between the straight line and the Lorentz curve. So, this is the area between the line of equality and the Lorentz curve which shows that by how much the households are earning below the uh, line of uh, equality and from the Lorentz curve we generally uh, come up with the uh, Gini coefficient. So, the Lorentz curve is a graph that shows the percentage of households plotted on the x axis and income percentage on the y axis. So, for the Lorentz curve the bottom n percent of society would always have n percent of the income and a perfectly equal distribution would be a uh, straight line where uh, y is equal to x. Now, the Gini coefficient uh, is uh, drawn from the Lorentz curve. It was uh, introduced by an Italian statistician called uh, co named uh, Corrado Gini and he introduced the Gini coefficient. It was published in his 1912 paper uh, variability and mutability. Uh, it is a measure of inequality of a distribution and it is def uh, defined as a ratio with values between 0 and 1. Uh, the numerator is the area between the Lorentz curve of the distribution and the uniform distribution line. Denominator is the area under the uniform distribution line. And sometimes the when the entire Lorentz curve is not known and only values at certain intervals are given, in that case the Gini coefficient can be approximated by using various techniques for interpolating the missing values of the Lorentz curve. So, for being able to calculate the Gini coefficient, 
let us denote this area between the line of equality and the Lorentz curve as say A and let this area below the Lorentz curve be denoted as B. So, based upon this distribution the Gini coefficient is basically a ratio of A by A plus B and it ranges from 0 to 1 and sometimes is also shown in the form of percentages ranging between 0 percent to 100 percent. So, when uh, the Gini coefficient is close to 0, we say that it is a more unequal society or the income distribution wealth distribution is more unequal and when it is closer to 1 or closer to 100 percent, then we say that it is a more equal society. So, the higher the values of Gini coefficient, the more equality there is and the lower the value of uh, the Gini coefficient, the more inequality there is. So, this is how the Gini uh, uh, index uh, shows. 0 cor corresponds to perfect income inequality, 1 corresponds to perfect income inequality uh, that is one person has all the income while everyone else has uh, uh, 0 uh, income. So, it is defined as the ratio of the areas on the Lorentz curve. If the area between the line of perfect equality and Lorentz curve is A and the area under the Lorentz curve is B, then the Gini coefficient is given by this ratio A by uh, A plus B. And since A plus B is equal to 0.5, the Gini coefficient G is equal to 2A that is equal to 1 minus 2B. And it is important to note here that uh, one of the reasons why the Gini coefficient is uh, most uh, widely used uh, measure of inequality in economics is that it satisfies most of the principles of uh, that, that, that provide us the guidelines for how an inequality measure should look like. It satisfies the principles of anonymity, uh, scale independence, population independence and the transfer principles. So, it does not matter who the high and low earners are, are to be able to uh, estimate the Gini coefficient. The Gini coefficient does not consider the size of the economy, the way it is measured or whether it is a rich or poor country on average and uh, the, it does not matter how large the population of the country is and if income uh, is transferred from a rich person to a poor person, the resulting distribution is more equal. So, it satisfies all of these principles because of which the Gini coefficient is a highly used measure of uh, inequality. Now, let us uh, uh, pinpoint what are some of the main advantages of uh, uh, using Gini coefficient as a uh, measure of inequality. Uh, it is a ratio analysis and uh, rather than a variable unrepresentative of most population such as per capita income or GDP. So, when we are using uh, gross domestic product or per capita income as a measure of inequality, we have already seen in the earlier classes how the uh, inherent limitation of GDP or per capita income is that it does not take into account or does not account for inequality within a country or a region. And uh, therefore, uh, even though the per capita income or GDP measures are very robust, it uh, does tell us what is the overall level of income within a country. It does not qualify as uh, a significant uh, indicator that can explain the very uh, huge levels of inequality existing within a uh, country. And it is in that sense that the Gini coefficient uh, becomes a more representative indicator of uh, inequality. So, it can be used to compare income distributions across different population sectors as well as countries. For example, the Gini coefficient for uh, urban areas differs from that of rural areas in many countries. Uh, in the, for example, the United States urban and rural, but the uh, United States urban and rural Gini coefficients are nearly identical. Now, this is one of the structural characteristics of uh, the advanced countries vis-a-vis -vis the low developed countries or the underdeveloped countries because the rural urban dichotomy in the advanced countries has uh, been bridged. Uh, therefore, the inequality, the, uh, the differences in inequality between rural and urban areas are not high in these countries as we see in the 
uh, developing countries or in the so called underdeveloped countries. It is also sufficiently simple that it can be compared, the Gini coefficient is sufficiently simple that it can be compared across countries and be easily interpreted. Uh, GDP statistics are often criticized as they do not represent changes for the whole population and the Gini coefficient demonstrates how income has changed for uh, poor and rich. So, if the Gini coefficient is rising as well as GDP, poverty may not be improving for the majority of the population. And this is this point is something which is very important where uh, the calculation of Gini coefficient for the uh, incomes income distribution within the population uh, will give us a sense of how far the economy has progressed. Often we look at only the GDP indicator which tells us that the GDP growth rate in this country has been such and such. A 7 percent or an 8 percent GDP growth rate within a country will not mean much if inequalities within a country has been rising over a uh, period of time, It is if it is closer to 100 percent. If only a very few uh, uh, sections of the population have access to large amounts of income within a country, then probably that rise in GDP may not mean much. So, uh, the GDP story te uh, tells us half the story and the Gini coefficient completes the story by telling us by how much the GDP growth rate has trickled down to the uh, to the uh, vulnerable sections of the population as well. So, in that sense if the Gini coefficient is rising as well as the GDP poverty may not be improving for the majority of the population. Thirdly, the Gini coefficient can be used to indicate how the distribution of income has changed within a country over a period of time. Thus, it is possible to see if inequality is increasing or decreasing. Uh, in the previous slide, I showed you here that uh, in the uh, usually when we are uh, calculating the Gini index or the Lorentz, when we are plotting the Lorentz curve, we uh, take households on the x axis and percentages of income or wealth on the y axis. But when um, these kinds of uh, plot uh, curves can also be uh, constructed for various other indicators which can be representative of uh, wealth inequality within a country. So, instead of income, we can also have uh, asset inequality when we are looking at uh, distribution of land holdings within a certain uh, region or a country or a, a state or a locality, then those kinds of distributions can also be plotted uh, on the uh, Lorentz curve here. So, instead of percentage of income, we can also uh, show the percentage of uh, land holdings on the uh, y axis here, which will tell us what is the correlation between the percentage of households and the percentages of uh, land holdings. So, in that sense, uh, this is a very good indicator of the levels of inequality within a country with respect to income, wealth or any other assets that may be. So, Gini coefficient can be used to indicate how the distribution of income has changed within a country over a period of time. So, it is possible to see if inequality is increasing or decreasing. Now, there are certain disadvantages of the Gini coefficient as well. Uh, the Gini coefficient uh, when it is measured for a large economically diverse country, uh, it will generally result in a much higher coefficient than each of its regions has individually. And so, for this reason, the scores calculated for individual countries within the EU are difficult to compare with the score of the entire US, say for example. Now, this is particularly true of developing countries such as India, where we see a large rural urban dichotomy. And not just that, as I have also already pointed out in uh, the earlier classes, that we have a very small formal sector and a very large informal sector. So, which means that the incomes of a large sex section of population is not being reported uh, in the GDP uh, estimates. So, the GDP estimate in that sense is not at all representative of the entire population of a country as vast as India, in which a majority of the population still works in the informal sector. A large section of the section of the population is in agriculture that does not report uh, regular uh, income earnings or does not have regular sources of incomes. So, in that sense, the Gini coefficient can actually fail to provide a representative picture of the entire population. So, when we are looking at the Gini coefficient based upon the GDP estimates of a country, we cannot very conclusively uh, say that okay, uh, uh, inequality within uh, India has been rising over a period of time or declining over a period of time because incomes have been uh, rising. Because anyway, we are not accounting for the incomes of a very of different sectors or segments uh, within the uh, Indian economy. There is an inherent limitation when we are considering a diverse country 
which has uh, diverse population and which has large numbers of population working in different sectors that are not being accounted for uh, formally in the national income accounts. So, the first disadvantage of uh, Gini coefficient is that uh, is this and comparing income distributions among countries may be difficult because benefits systems uh, may differ. So, for example, some countries give benefits in the form of money while others give food stamps which may not be counted as income in the Lorentz curve and therefore not taken into account in the uh, Gini coefficient. To give an example which is very specific to countries such as India, you would uh, know that uh, uh, in India we have, uh, um, India is a welfare state and therefore we have various kinds of welfare uh, programs uh, running within the country. Uh, so, for example, in a in a, let let us take the uh, uh, take an example of uh, say Assam, and uh, let us say there is a program called the Public Distribution System, which is functioning in Assam, or the National Food Security Act, which is being implemented in Assam, and uh, various uh, people have access to uh, what is called ration cards or uh, BPL cards, and therefore they uh, have access to uh, food grains. Uh, say rice or wheat from the uh, ration shops. Now, while these are benefits that are accruing uh, to individuals or households within a, within a region, it is very difficult to translate these benefits in terms of incomes. So, these are doles which are being given out to households uh, to meet their uh, specific uh, consumption requirements. Say, for example, children uh, going to primary schools have access to the midday meal program and therefore, they, uh, they are getting meals uh, within the schooling system such that they can continue with their schooling system as well as get nourishment out of it. But when we are uh, accounting for incomes of the households, uh, uh, the accounting system would generally uh, take only those incomes which are being reported as part of the national income accounts uh, statistics. But these benefits does not get translated into actual incomes in terms of the accounting uh, purposes. So, in that sense the Gini coefficient may not give a very clear picture, it may not represent the, uh, it, it may not translate itself into the real story with respect to uh, the uh, expenditures or the uh, benefits that the uh, incomes and the benefits that the households and the individuals are getting within a within an economy. Secondly, the measure will give different results when applied to individuals instead of households. When different populations are not measured with consistent definitions, comparison is not meaningful. This is one of the very important uh, limitations of the Gini coefficient uh, because in a country such as India, we have seen that um, there is a large scale uh, intra household. Uh, uh, inequality in uh, distribution of resources. So, when we are saying household income, uh, we the these this income need not necessarily be equally distributed among all the members of the household. So, in that sense, when we are measuring uh, uh, Gini coefficient uh, by uh, households, it uh, leads it gives a misleading picture of the levels of inequality because the levels of inequality that uh, shows up this way may actually be much more higher if we take into account the individual incomes rather than the household incomes because generally the household incomes are much higher but when we uh, when we peg the household income to each of the members within the family we would see that some members within the family earn much less or have uh, uh, have, have very less to partake from the entire in uh, household uh, income. So, this is why the measure gives very different results when it is applied to individuals instead of households. So, when different populations are not measured with consistent definitions, comparison is not uh, uh, meaningful. Thirdly, the Lorentz curve or the Gini coefficient may understate the actual amount of inequality if richer households are able to use income more efficiently than uh, lower income households. From another point of view, measured inequality may be uh, the result of more or less efficient use of uh, household uh, incomes. Fourthly, as for all statistics, there will be systematic and random errors in the data. So, the meaning of Gini coefficient decreases as the data becomes uh, less accurate. So, countries may collect data differently making it difficult to compare statistics between countries and this is one of the major uh, limitations again when we uh, come to comparability of data across countries. So, uh, the statistical systems of the country have a uh, lot 
uh, to uh, uh, do there is a lot lacking within the statistical systems within a country often the data that is collected uh, from various sources let us say from agriculture or from industry or uh, from uh, based upon household surveys are not consistent from year to year there are definitional changes from year to year and there is a lot of uh, data discrepancy uh, because of various uh, issues and this data discrepancy may become one of the important uh, uh, barriers uh, to coming up with a good index of uh, inequality. So, the plottings of Lorentz curve may not be accurate because there is a lot of data discrepancy and data inaccuracy and uh, this is one. Number two, because there are uh, different uh, systems of data collection in different countries. So, a Gini index which is calculated for a country A may not be strictly comparable to a Gini index which is calculated for country B. Uh, therefore, we cannot with a lot of surety say that uh, the Gini uh, based upon the Gini index alone uh, the uh, inequality comparisons between all countries uh, can be uh, made very conclusively. If you recall the paper uh, that we uh, studied uh, in uh, uh, the in lesson 1 of this week, you will see that Branko Milanovic has made uh, extensive use of the Gini coefficient for being able to calculate world inequality. Now, uh, one of the important things is that in the absence of any other better indicator of inequality, Gini coefficient still continues to be one of the most representative uh, indicators in spite of its uh, limitations. The next uh, disadvantage is that economies with similar incomes and Gini coefficients can still have uh, very uh, different income distributions and this is because the Lorentz curves can have different shapes and yet uh, still yield the same Gini coefficient. So, as an extreme example, an economy where half the households have no income and the other half uh, share income equally has a Gini coefficient of uh, 0.5. But an economy with complete income inequality except for one wealthy household that has half the total income also has a Gini coefficient of 0.5. Now, what is important in this is that the shape of the Lorentz curve and the Gini coefficient both matter. So, we are, while we need to see what is the overall inequality index by looking at the overall Gini coefficient, it is also equally important to know what is the proportion of population that is below the line of inequality. And therefore, the Lorentz curve and the Gini coefficient always needs to be studied together. They need to be examined together to be able to come up with a more meaningful uh, conclusion with respect to uh, inequality, poverty and inequality within a country. So, the shape of the Lorentz curve is very important. Uh, it need not necessarily be uh, a perfectly shaped uh, Lorentz curve. The uh, shape of the Lorentz curve may be such that uh, uh, the, there may be a lot of people, uh, there may be uh, the, a large numbers of uh, households or proportion of households may be located in the middle where they have access to large uh, uh, share of wealth or income uh, within an economy uh, compared to the uh, rest. So, when we are examining the issue of inequality, the shape of the Lorentz curve and the Gini coefficient, the index, both of them need to be examined uh, together. And that is what uh, 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 this uh, point means that economies with similar incomes and Gini coefficients can still have very different income distribution. So, the kind of distribution studying and examining the kind of income distribution is very important. Now, uh, too often only the Gini coefficient is quoted without describing the proportions of the quantiles used uh, for measurement. As with other inequality coefficients, Gini coefficient is influenced by the granularity of the measurements. So, for example, 5 20 percent quantiles will yield a lower Gini coefficient than 25 percent quantiles taken from the uh, same uh, distribution. So, these are things that needs to be uh, kept in mind that quoting a Gini coefficient without describing the proportions of the quantiles used for measurement will not be a very fruitful exercise. Now, this is a snapshot of uh, the inequality in income or expenditure across countries as reported in uh, one of the human development reports. I have uh, brought it here on this slide to uh, give you an example of how the Gini index is reported. If you look at the last column here, this last column here shows the uh, Gini index of uh, income or expenditure. In some cases it is income, in some cases it is expenditure and it shows uh, these are in percentage terms. So, which means uh, if uh, Sierra Leone has 62.9% uh, Gini index and Niger has 50.5, 
which means that Sierra Leone is a more unequal country than uh, Niger is. Similarly, uh, here if you look at this series here, the country uh, which has, uh, these are mostly the sub-Saharan African countries and among the sub-Saharan African countries, the country which has the lowest Gini index is uh, Ethiopia and uh, the highest is uh, uh, Sierra Leone here, which means that among these uh, groups of uh, countries, Ethiopia is relatively an unequal country compared to uh, Sierra Leone. If you note here that this inequality is calculated across incomes or expenditures and this is something probably I have touched upon in one of the earlier classes where I have mentioned and if some of you have missed out, it basically means that many uh, countries, uh, uh, the statistical databases of many countries uh, uh, some countries collect data on incomes whereas some countries collect data more on expenditures and often expenditure is treated as a proxy for income because the idea is that if you have income you will spend on uh, service on basic services so say on food or non-food expenditures so sometimes it uh, becomes it is more uh, it makes more sense to collect data on expenditures than on income uh, to be able to come up with uh, proper uh, translations of how how much development has taken place. So, some countries have income data, some countries have expenditure data and this is something that I have, we have seen in Branko Milanovic's paper also where uh, he has collected uh, data based upon a household service collect, uh, done in various parts of the uh, world, various countries across the world where uh, uh, some countries give data on incomes and some countries give data on expenditures and they have been collated together to be able to come up with a uh, Gini uh, coefficient. So, uh, here uh, in the human development reports also the inequality indices are being calculated and it shows us how many uh, poorest 10 percent, poorest 20 percent, richest 20 percent, richest 10 percent and uh, what is the share of their income or expenditure. So, for example, in uh, Guinea here the poorest 10 percent have access to only 2.6 percent of their share in total income is only 2.6 percent whereas the richest 10 percent share in income or expenditure is 32 percent and this is the significance of being able to calculate uh, the Gini coefficient or the plotting the Lorentz curve. It tells us what is the proportion of population within a country that has access to income and wealth and this gives us a sense of uh, the uh, social justice within the country and what are the different kinds of uh, plans and policies that can be designed keeping this in mind. Similarly, if you see the country which showed highest inequality here Sierra Leone, you will see that poorest 10 percent uh, the, the share of the poorest 10 percent in total income and expenditure is only 0.5 percent whereas the share of the richest 10 percent is 43.6 percent. So, it makes sense to say that this country is relatively more unequal than the rest in these group of sub-Saharan African countries. Similarly, if you look at Ethiopia, the poorest 10 percent have a share in the total income and expenditure, the poorest 10 percent have only about 4 percent uh, share, the richest 10 percent have about 26 percent share, the poorest 20 percent share about 9.1 percent, the richest 20 percent have a share of about 39 percent. So, which means that the poorer countries exhibit very high levels of inequality, the poorer countries are uh, poor because the richer sections of the population have more access to incomes, have more access to basic services, have more access to the resources within the country than the poorest sections of the uh, population. So, in this class uh, we, uh, we made a slight detour into looking at two uh, major uh, measures of inequality the Lorentz curve and the Gini coefficient. We looked at uh, how to interpret the Lorentz curve and the Gini coefficient, how to plot the Lorentz curve and how to estimate the Gini coefficient and in looking at the advantages and the disadvantages of uh, the Gini coefficient and the Lorentz curve, we also tried to see uh, why and how uh, the Gini coefficient continues to be one of the most important indicators or ma most important estimates of uh, being able to measure inequality uh, within a country uh, or a region. We also looked at, uh, we, we also saw that the Gini coefficient satisfies most of the 
principles that qualify uh, to be a good measure of inequality. And uh, we ended with how the uh, most important reports such as the UNDP's human development reports also make uh, extensive use of the Gini index to be able to tell us uh, what is the proportion of population that has access to uh, different levels of incomes and wealth within a country and how different policies and welfare programs can be designed based upon uh, these uh, findings. Thank you.